Listening is key. There have been plenty of moments of tension along my leadership journey. In fact, one of my fondest experiences was being part of a week-long community organizing conference that happened in the United States, where all the participants were from different faith backgrounds, community organizations, unions, etc. One of our tasks was to meet as many people uh, who had participated in this conference as possible, having relational meetings with them, where we explored each other's stories and our self-interest, reasons we are motivated to serve and to be on mission. And again, listening was key because as people started to reveal to me their different ideologies and perspectives and opinions, I was invited to humble myself before the other. In that, I was able to refine my own beliefs, my own understanding of who I am and who God is. And so as much as we would like to perhaps sometimes assert who we are in leadership, part of the deepening of our well of understanding of the world around us is definitely being open to the differences that exist. These tensions give us the fuller picture of what we are called to be and exist in. And so in terms of uh, effective ways of dealing with conflicting views and ideologies, absolutely listening is key, but being open to receiving them is much, much uh, just as important. Navigating conflicting views and ideologies requires a combination of diplomacy, effective communication, and a commitment to finding common ground. Based on my own experiences in collaborative research and leadership roles, here are some strategies that I've found to be effective. First, have an open, respectful communication. Ensure that all perspectives are heard and valued. Actively listen to the concerns and viewpoints of other leaders and express your thoughts in a constructive manner not condescending manner. By promoting a culture of open dialogue, you create space for understanding and collaboration. Second, seeking common ground. Identify areas of agreement and shared goals. Even in the presence of conflicting views, there are often common objectives that can serve as a foundation for collaboration. Highlighting these commonalities can help build a sense of unity and facilitate cooperation. The third one is when conflicts arise, approach them with a mindset focused on resolution rather than escalation. Focus on win-win solutions. Utilize conflict resolution strategies that promote understanding such as negotiation and mediation. This ensures that conflicts are addressed in a constructive manner, leading to stronger collaboration. Fourth one is building trust. Invest time and effort in building strong relationships and trust among the leadership team. Trust is essential for effective collaboration and it serves as a foundation for resolving conflicts. When leaders trust each other, they are most likely to approach disagreements with a collaborative mindset, seeking solutions rather than fostering division. By employing these strategies, I've been able to navigate conflicting views and ideologies in collaborative settings fostering a culture of cooperation and achieving shared objectives. Often it can be challenging to come across views that are different from my own. And I find it really important in those moments to be able to do two things. First of all, is to listen deeply. Listening deeply to what the other is saying and what they're not saying what's beyond the words. So particularly when there's conflicting ideologies, to be able to, to listen deeply is, is so important. And something also important for me when there are differing ideas 
is to take a breath. Sometimes there can be a temptation to, to respond really quickly, to, to think I have to have the answer immediately. But it's about taking a breath. It's about just going, okay, centering myself and, and not having to react the first or the fastest, but to be able to breathe. So for me, listening and breathing are two really important things to do when there are those conflicting ideologies, which can, can often happen. Conflicting ideologies often arise from people having different understandings of the world they live in. Or within a work environment, it might mean different perspectives on an issue they are dealing with or a problem they are trying to solve. Everyone has their own experiences on which they base and share their views. Catholic leadership encourages dialogue and a commitment to finding common ground. I have found that engaging in respectful conversations guided by principles of love, understanding and humility helps me see another person's point of view. Being open to learning from others whilst being unafraid to speak one's truth can help a group reconcile conflicting views and find a way forward together. Within a Catholic organization, recognition of the shared mission and being focused on that greater mission serves as a unifying force, fostering collaboration and growth despite ideological differences. So first of all, can I start by saying that not all forms of conflict are negative? That might seem to be a little bit counterintuitive, but actually conflict can be a really positive part of your leadership style because there are ways in which you can use conflict to actually bring to the table some of those conflicting views and ideologies in a constructive way. So first of all, I think what you need to do in those situations is to do your homework first. You need to know who's, who's at the table and what their views are. So you don't want surprises when you're coming into a discussion around something that's quite technical or, or quite controversial. And as well as knowing their perspectives, you need to also understand their own stakeholders. So who are they accountable to? And why does, how does that actually in, impact on the way in which they're participating in um, the conversation? So once you've gathered all of the views, you have to think about how they view the work of resolving the shared challenge that you're discussing. You know, what are their commitments? And to what extent do they need to own some kind of a change that you're trying to generate in the outcome that you're looking to achieve? So a good example of that might be perhaps um, in a simple way, I, I can give you the example of ACSL. So there are some people within the church who think that sexual abuse is something of the past it's historical, it doesn't happen anymore. And that's a view that they may have because they don't have much engagement with children anymore. You know, elderly religious or clergy who don't do much with children. So they think, well, you know, the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards don't apply to me. So in our leadership program, we actually have to talk about the notion of safeguarding as being much more than about protecting against sexual abuse. We have to talk about safeguarding as the way in which we imbue a concept of care and well-being for the people within the organisations. And for those elderly religious institutes, that's not about children anymore. It's about frail, elderly, members of the clergy or religious, nuns who may be in their 70s or 80s who may have health issues, you know, those who are moving into stages of dementia or, um, you know, palliative care and thinking about the governance and the safeguarding issues that are around all of those aspects. So you have different people at the table and you really have to think about what are their perspectives 
coming to the discussion that you have. Um, the other thing I suppose is to establish some ground rules. I know that sounds silly, but if you ask for some clear and consistent ground rules, that can actually help to depersonalize the process and keep the work at the center of what you're trying to do. So try to get some rules and some norms for the group set early. Um, for example, you know, who sets the agenda for a conversation like this? Um, is it an agreed agenda? People don't add things to the agenda for the meeting or the, the discussion. You set a time frame around the discussion. You determine what information is confidential. Those kinds of things that just kind of set some parameters around a discussion with other leaders. You know, we often talk about Chatham House rules. People may not understand exactly what the obligations of Chatham House rules are, but it's important sometimes to be quite explicit in that. These things stay in the room. Stay in the room. We don't use this information to leverage against anyone else. We don't use it for our advantage. We use it to support each other in understanding each other's perspectives. And that's as far as it goes. Now, if there's something that's really challenging, the next thing that you can do as a leader, if you're in a room in a situation like that, is you can actually orchestrate some conflict. And I know that sounds a bit weird, but it's actually sometimes important because sometimes other participants in that group may be avoiding conflict. And so you need to look for the clues. You need to think about, um, are people kind of summarizing each other's perspectives and then kind of minimizing the difference between them? Or are they ignoring an issue entirely? Um, they might be blaming or scapegoating instead of actually owning the issue themselves. There may be some who aren't participating in the discussion. So you have to, you know, if you're leading this conversation, you need to remind participants that it's actually your role to surface and discuss those kinds of tensions. And that can be a bit tricky. And then it's important to promote honesty. So recognizing who stands to lose in those conversations can be really important and what the implications, as I said before, might be for their own stakeholders or their own constituents. And think about that. And then use those conversations to generate different potential solutions and try to build consensus around what will be tested and don't grow too attached too quickly to any one solution or idea. And the idea is to keep generating conversation allow people to have the time to find a common ground. And sometimes, as you know, in the art of negotiation, if the conflict still exists, you go back to where you found common ground. And that's the end of that session before you start again.